Hey there, Caleb Wojcik here, and welcome to the show. In this episode, I talk to Levi Allen, who's an adventure filmmaker from British Columbia, and he's been a friend of mine for a few years now, both on the internet and in person. We've worked together, I've hired him for client shoots before, and he's just a super talented guy. So in this episode, we talk at the beginning mainly about his film Untethered, which is the short film he made a few years ago that got a Vimeo staff pick and how that built a lot of buzz up for him and he thought it would do certain things client-wise. He actually took it down from Vimeo and had it distributed, but that maybe that wasn't the right decision for him to make and how he now kind of fought back for the rights to it and posted it again publicly on his YouTube channel. So we talk a little bit about that story as well as a lot of tips for doing client work and how he's actually built up a business making videos for people and how his YouTube channel started to have even more success after he let his personality shine through a little bit instead of just making whatever kinds of videos he thought he should make. So hope you enjoy this episode. Let's dive into the conversation. Levi, thanks for being here. Caleb Wajkick, it's good to be here. Why are you saying my name wrong? Why you gotta start I know like it's that? Wajkick, Waj. Wajik. Wajik. I it's like fine. saying Wajik. This is good. We're teaching people how to say my last name. Nobody really knows. It's, like it's an fine. education process. What about your last name? <laughs> Vanderquack. Vanderquack. Why don't you go by that online? Uh, well, it turns out that on Instagram, the length of a handle is more than my last name combined with my first name. Really? That's the it's reason? Shorter. I've, I said that the wrong way. You can't fit it in an Instagram handle. That's why. Yeah. yeah. It's just too long. So you use your long. middle name. Yeah. Levi Allen Vanderquack is my full name. And I've gone with Levi Allen because you can't Because it's it. easier to spell, too. Yeah. And so, seeing, seeing how hard Gary Vaynerchuk swings on the... Gary Vaynerchuk! Yeah. Makes me go like, hey, I probably could have... Like, Quack. Yeah, I probably could have owned that. But no one knew how to spell it. And I couldn't fit it in usernames. So I, I bailed. So you are who you are now, Levi yeah. Allen. Thanks for joining me. Um, we talked... I think for the first time ever was when I had you on my podcast years ago when it was running. And... You just gotten a Vimeo staff pick on a short film that you made called Untethered, which is about slackliners, people that are crazy, in my opinion, and <laughs> string up a line, it's like, high up in the air and walk across it. And you made this short film. You put a lot of time and effort into it and you got a Vimeo staff pick. And then you kind of started to do YouTube around that time as well, get momentum teaching filmmaking to people and starting to build an audience so get me up to date on that short film, because I think that's an interesting story that will kind of take us into the rest of the conversation of what you ended up doing with that film and getting it distributed. Yeah, so that, that film was originally, it basically came out in January 2016, which is right around when we chatted on the podcast. And that was like January 2016 was the first month I went full time on my business. So building up to that point, I was, I mean, I think I was three or four years out of high school at this point and video had been a hobby for me, but it had always been the kind of hobby that I was like, I could build a business out of this. And maybe that would be the area in my life where I could have a lot of fun, but also build a great business out of, cause that's been something that I've been thinking about since I was a kid, like what kind of business am I going to run? And talking with other creatives and people that did photography, did video for their jobs, a theme that was a little alarming to me, especially in some of the people that I was talking to that were close to me was just this sense that, you know, once you start working for clients, like basically the fun is over, like it's done. So get ready. It's going to be a drag. You're going to be working constantly for clients that you probably don't like. So that's just how it is and get used to it. Like don't even maybe do it as a career if you want to keep doing it for fun. Mm -hmm. And my thought process was there's got to be, a, there's got to be a different way. Um, I maybe naively thought uh, that was possible. And so before I even jumped in going full time, I was complaining about the gear I had. I had all these excuses for why my videos weren't good. And so I told myself, basically, speaking of Instagram, in my bio, it said cinematographer and storyteller. <laughs> this is a, we're talking like I was shooting on a Canon T2i with a 51.8 and just like shooting leaves. And I was calling myself a cinematographer. <laughs> yeah like using Home Depot lights and uh, like I was, I was brutal, uh, but I was like, I'm a storyteller. And so I knew I was, I felt this imposter syndrome big. And I was like, if I want to own this as what I say I do, let's see what it looks like to actually try do what I, what, what actually entices me about video, which is when someone watches a video, it makes them feel something. So that was like early on, I was, how, how do I solve that? 
instead of, you know, waiting 10 years. Yeah. So is that why you set out to make Untethered in the first place? Like with your own money, your own time, passion project entirely? Mm -hmm. I was, I literally reached a point where I've, I've been at this since 2011, like tinkering with video and I'd done some freelance work, done some weddings and there came a time where I was about, my full-time job was ending. Um, it was a job where I was traveling and working pretty intensely. So there wasn't tons of space for making stuff, but that time was coming to an end and I was going, okay, this is now my time to, to try filmmaking. But I had a problem where I didn't have any client emails anymore. Like earlier I was getting some emails cause I had work that was relevant and online, but after about two years of not posting anything, and then three years, like those emails stopped coming. Yeah. So I had zero leads, which is a problem if I want to do client work. And my gear I felt was outdated. So I thought, hey, how do I, how do I go out and make a great film, but also learn, do I want to run a business at all that's in this category? Because I'm, I'm hearing this advice that, hey, this might actually be awful. <laughs> What's it truly like? And so there's two guys that I followed that ran their own production company in the city and they had a red camera. What which, city? Uh, Vancouver. Vancouver. That's where I'm based out of, just outside the city. And I, I met these guys at a few random events and I, I kind of respected the way that they were doing their business. And from the outside looking in, it was like, okay, these guys have families, they have relationships with other people. Like it looks like they have a stable life and they're doing great work. Like I wonder what it would be like to work in their environment and just kind of learn on the fly and also get access to their gear. Yeah. So that's, that's, how I jumped into the summer straight after my full-time, my, my full-time job. And while I was there, once I finally had the red camera, I finally had no more excuses gear wise. I asked myself, okay, what am I going to do with this? And I was like, I would love to walk away from this summer with a 15 minute film. That's anything close to this vision I've had of being a storyteller. Cause at that point, the closest is like these micro doc three minute things that were kind of storytelling, but it was always an afterthought. There was never a true vision. Um, and were those things for clients or for fun for yourself or? I mean, most of those were just me making video. My brother's a musician, so mm -hmm. he had some musicians. So I just started making videos about music and mountain biking, but I knew there was like, like a quality of it missing that if I wanted to be this filmmaker storyteller guy, because I mean, at that time, everyone was saying story is so important. So that seemed, that seemed to be what made a video that would give an emotional response in the people that watch it. You know, like the typical when you're sitting in the theater and you like feel, feel the chills, like that's what I, I wanted to create that for people. Uh, and also there's a sense of, I think there's people out there who probably need a voice that I would love, I would love to be the person that helps draw out those stories one day. Um, and, and so I just like made that my goal. Like I need to leave this summer with a film that I'm proud of, or, or maybe I should stop. And once I like saw it with that level of clarity, like if I can't make a film in a summer, then I'm probably not cut out to do this. And that's perfectly okay. It's like, if I don't want, I might learn this summer that I don't like doing this as a business. And I might learn this summer that I don't have the skills to tell a story, but those are two lessons that I would love to learn sooner rather than later before I go further down this road. And so this was a risk you're willing to take at age 21, 22? Yeah, I would so? have been, been 21. And so this was at a point in your life where a risk was less risky too. Yeah. I mean, probably at that time it might've felt more risky than it actually was. I'm pretty risk averse. Like I don't, Me does too. risk averse mean I'm okay with risk? Is that what averse means? I just assume that risk. No, that averse. means you avoid it. Oh I, yeah. I'm fine with risk. That's what I mean. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like, I'm totally. You're risky business. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I mean, to me, it's like, if it fails, as long as I don't go into all this debt, like we're fine. Like, I mean, I have, I have family members that I could go sleep on their couch. Like when you're young like that, I feel like you can bounce back pretty quick and find any job you can live with family. Yeah. yeah. I was so willing to just do anything to pay bills. So if it didn't work out, I was fine to just like downgrade life for a moment, stop, stop pursuing passion, stop pursuing business building and just kind of like reset. But the scary part was, is literally the month that I left my job is when I proposed to my now wife. <laughs> so there's like this this little layer going on here where one, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm about to get married and my journey to having to basically, I, I always had the sense that I wanted to like build a career and a business. And to me, like marriage felt like a turning of age as an adult kind of thing. And I had always expected that I'd be further down the road by the time that happened. 
So I was a little taken aback that I wasn't further down the business building road. And I kind of had this like, like panicking moment a little bit. But then I also realized we're not getting married for another year. Um, she's got a full-time job and we're going to be living in separate cities for half the time we're engaged. Like I almost have zero responsibilities to anyone. So it was like a unique moment where I was like, I could get away with working 12, 14 hour days for this season and, and actually pull it off. So is that what you did for <laughs> six months? That's what I did for six months. Yeah. It was, uh, it wasn't very enjoyable as far as like the day to day work, but at the same time I was having so much fun because I was working in a production company and working on this film. And that brings us to like at the end of the summer, it basically there was this process where I found the subject matter for the film, which ended up being these slackliners I just ran to. There's this interesting thing that happens when you decide to go for it. You're looking for, you're looking for the solution everywhere. You're like hungry. And this was the first time that I was truly hungry for it. And so I like met some people on the beach, I joined a Facebook group and like this chain of events just linked together where suddenly I found myself meeting these slackliners that were some of the best in North America. I was kind of like, hey, can I, can I follow you guys with a camera? And his response was interesting because he was like, this guy's Spencer and he was a bit of an intimidating personality. Like when I came up to him first, he, he was like rigging a slack line with his shirt off with a cigarette in his mouth and he like pours concrete. So he's just like, he's kind of like this Jack dude and, yeah. and he's a, a little bit, like intense. And so I was kind of just like, whoa, this guy is like gnarly. And he free solos where he like takes his harness off and walks lines. It's, it's nuts. So he's an intense personality. And he, I was, so I asked him, I was like, can I follow you with a camera? And I'll never forget. He like looked at me. He's like, look, dude, lots of people come, they shoot. I never see anything. Do what you want. It's kind so of like, like huh. a challenge. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I like, I am going to show up. You are going to see an edit and it's going to be awesome. And I didn't know it at the time, but that person ended up being like the main character in this first film that I ever made. And he went on to set a world record, which, I mean, that was very fortunate on my part to have met him at the right time. And my thought process was, I'll leave the company that I'm currently apprenticing with. I'll go start my own thing. And this film that I'm making will be the single biggest marketing tool that will get me all these jobs. It'll be your demo reel that you can show to whoever in the outdoor adventure kind of yeah. space to, to hire you. I thought like I re I'll release this thing and Patagonia will be begging me to like come make a video for them. And that's only after I had the film like edited. I was like, I was for one, the goal was accomplished. I made a story that I was legitimately proud of, which hadn't happened before. So I was like, okay, I like I can do this story thing. And now could I do it as a business? And I grew up on the narratives from other filmmakers in this DSLR era where they would make a documentary, put it on Vimeo, get a staff pick and listening to podcasts, they would say, and then my email just blew up. And suddenly I was working on commercial projects all over the world. And here's where I made a big mistake that I think we all make where we expect the same thing that worked for others will work for me too. Yeah. <laughs> Those were different times when maybe it worked for them than for you or for getting a staff pick now or what have you. But yeah, definitely careers of people that we could name were built off of early staff picks and work they had put out and that people came to the door and started their like commercial directing career or what have you. So what happened for you? Yeah, I, so it, the short story is it wasn't until a year and a half later that I got any email client related that referenced Untethered or anything. <laughs> and and so in in the months after releasing this thing, I was, I was in expectation. There was anticipation building. And I had this mindset of, I don't want to take on projects that aren't outdoor based because I had an awareness of what niching down meant. And so I was like, I'll say no to basically everything that's not related to what I want to do because I want to put out and do work that aligns with the company I want to build, which is outdoor work. Like that's what got me excited. So that's what, that's what I should do for client work. So I was stubborn. So I'm getting emails from some people because I was, I mean, I didn't just release Untethered. I had some other videos that were now starting to come out. And so people were finding me, asking me to do work and I wasn't taking them. And, uh, and I was just like waiting for, for more outdoor work and it wasn't coming. <laughs> and that was, uh, that sucked. Cause that was, that, I thought it would be kind of this magic bullet marketing solution of you make this amazing story. You put your email in the description and they will come. 
didn't you tell me that people were even using your film to pitch other projects? <laughs> yeah, I and this was this was probably peak frustration for me where yeah. I the athletes that I filmed with I found out that so the film the film did fairly well online and uh, a certain expert from that film the free solo component uh, completely blew up on the drone pilots YouTube channel like a million and a half views so suddenly this very unique activity was in front of a lot of companies that maybe wanted access to that story or they wanted to incorporate it into a commercial and so I started hearing from the athletes that they were like doing commercials and that the, the cast and the talent that the crew that was there working on the commercial and the agency and everyone was referencing this film that I had made as their example. But you weren't there. But I was, I like wasn't getting invited. And it, I was just like, man, like you got to plug me more guys. Like, and they're like, we try, but they've just got the people that they work with and they want to make their ad and they're just going to do what they do. So like I had enabled, I had given a tool set to the athletes in a way for them to start establishing a professional. They had already been working at it, but it was mm -hmm. just like another tool in their toolbox. And it was just, it was a little, it was a little frustrating. And at the lowest point, I was hired as a camera operator for someone else's project that they were getting paid for by a network in Canada to make basically like kind of like a rip off bio of what I felt my project was. And so I was there camera operating on this, getting paid like a crappy daily rate. And I was like, this is, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but that, then that like leads me to one of my biggest pet peeves is where like complaining. And I found myself complaining to myself, like I was frustrated. And I have a friend, uh, a mutual friend actually, Sean McCabe, and he talks about this concept of the rule of seven. And it applies to a lot of different areas, but basically it's, if you're wanting to get client work, if you're wanting to win over a customer or someone who's gonna trust you, you have to get in front of them at least seven times for them to remember. Or if you're trying to teach something, you have to say it in seven different ways for it to truly be remembered. And that's where I kind of just realized, oh, I made one thing. Sure, I've got some of these YouTube videos and this other stuff and blog posts, but like truly I have one great film. And I realized I don't really have the right to get annoyed that brands aren't hiring me from it until I make seven. And that kind of just re, that kind of was a shifting point for me where I got motivated again and I had to start doing some other freelancing, like editing. I did a lot of editing work in those days to just pay for stuff. Yeah. But uh, that was like a good shifting point for me where I realized, okay, this reputation building thing might take a little longer than I, than I want, but I think if I'm patient, it might work out. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you got that short film distributed for a while and then you kind of got the rights back to yeah. it? And just some thoughts about making things online and releasing them for free, I kind of think is, is the lesson or the, the direction I want to go and what that can enable you versus, you know, selling to clients or selling for distribution or just any lessons learned from that. Right. After, after Untethered was made, there was, I mean, a handful of people that I, that I met at NAB the following year that were like, dude, you got to sell this thing. Like, why did you put it online for free? And, and I was kind of just like, you, you don't understand. Like I had, I have no relationship. Who would have bought it? Like th there was no one yelling on the street. Who wants to yeah. buy my movie? Like, it, yeah. I'm like the world's worst producer. Like I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that kind of person that's great at building those connections. So I'm real, I'm relying solely on the people that I meet or those that I see out there that I know I can reach out to, but I'm not good at finding these relationships out of nowhere. Uh, but so that's literally what happened. I got an email that was like, Hey, we would like to play your film on TV. And that triggered a cascading of events of eventually being recommended a company to help distribute it. Cause the first, the first person that was interested, they didn't have enough uh, capital up front to actually make it worthwhile because their big thing was it had to come down for free. And I had originally released it for free because that was the marketing tool. That yeah. was the thing. This was like my hoorah coming of age as a filmmaker moment. Uh, and so the film was online for free for about a full year. So the views had kind of plateaued on both Vimeo and YouTube. And so when he's offering this TV deal, I thought maybe, maybe this would lead me down a road where being able to say my film was on TV was, is a worthwhile thing. And maybe I could actually get a bunch of cash because I invested a lot of my own time and money into making it. And that would be, that would be handy. 
because especially once I realized I need to make six more if I want to get like if I want to get noticed and build a, a build a reputation you around have to this. fund them and yeah have some runway so you have time to do them and not have to just take editing jobs and all that exactly and so that was the plan of like maybe if I could get a sale here for the film that would enable more creative work and that would be a good thing for me and I ended up working with a distributor who uh, basically they shopped the film first because I was unwilling to commit to anything and they they said they had lined up some deals that were that were good like good enough um, I, th I think I have no problem saying like it was it was around supposed to be around 20 grand total uh, and that meant I had to pull down the film and it was going to be offline for a while but then then I would have a film on broadcast and so I committed to that and then I realized upgrading the music licensing is very very expensive so suddenly I'm five grand short upgrading all the there's like 21 songs in that film so I'm trying to hustle and email all these artists trying to get a, the best rate I can just explaining myself. But I mean, even 500 bucks for another song, it's like, I mean, I didn't have tons of runway. Straight out of your pocket. Yeah. But I was like, it's okay. Like there's money coming within months. Like that's what I was, that's what I was told. And the hard part in the cloud over those first two years as, as a solo filmmaker was like the money didn't come. And that's like, I like almost like I'm almost, like I can feel like emotion welling because like I'm just married, just made this film. I spent money I shouldn't have getting it ready, and I'm telling my wife that hey, this filmmaking thing's gonna work. Trust me. And month to month, I'm waiting for this payment to come, and I'm just basically being led by fairy dust, being like it'll come next week, next week, next week. And I mean. We're now, we're now two years later and eventually money came, but the cloud that that put over and the stress was like, it's one thing to know your money's not going to come. Then you can just like, oh, that move, really move sucks. On. Yeah. yeah. But at, like when you have so little capital as a young adult and at any point you like your bank might get a $10,000 influx, that's a really, really big deal. And I was like... On my, I was on my toes. I was just like, this will change things for me because we were living really simply. So 10 grand goes a long way when your expenses are like 1500 bucks a month. So the, the, don't, don't distribute your film is the moral of my story unless you trust the distributor. distributor. Uh, there's obviously a lot of nuances in what happened. The, the, distribu the distribution company was going through some stuff and there's probably some great reasons here or there, but the truth is they got paid and they spent my money on something else and I didn't. And that was such a slap in the face and it just proved me right because I was so nervous going up to it and then I was proved that my nervousness was right. Casey Neistat made all these videos talking about how he thought the dream was getting an Oscar, making a series on TV. He got a show on HBO. They put it at a midnight slot on a day no one watches and it hardly went anywhere. And like that was supposed to be the dream and it didn't pan out. And his message has constantly been the internet world of video is a big opportunity right now. And the people that take advantage of it are going to have, are going to grow and what they will build through that. And the opportunity they have to connect with the viewer is phenomenal. And that's what convinced me to release it for free in the first place. In part, it was like marketing and, Hey, I just want to do this. Cause it seems awesome. seems like guerrilla filmmaking. Uh, and so when I, I felt like I sold out when I pulled the film down in, in ways I, I really wish I hadn't done that. But I also can't fault younger me for being willing to take an investment on like something I worked really hard on, but I never should have done it. So two years later now through some kerfuffle, uh, it's, it's online right now. Uh, I can say it's online and I'm doing what I can to keep it there despite some uh, disagreements along the way in different fashions. Mm -hmm. And so you released it when you hit 100,000. Yeah, that was like the re-release party. And it's been well received. And a lot more people have seen it now that your audience is bigger, I think, too. Yeah, there's been a... Because I've been making stuff on YouTube for a couple of years, I haven't tackled a project this big since. Like a single... I've never made a 30-minute documentary since this one. Uh, this one was re originally premiered in 2015, of December 2015. So now... And at that time, my audience on YouTube would have been like 2,500 subscribers. And that's like right around. So this is what was so cool. Like releasing this film is like what let me meet you. And you like you were one of the first YouTube relationship, like other people that had a filmmaking channel of any kind. 
And so in a lot of ways, it was really smart that I put it out there because it actually let me start to connect with other filmmakers. And I, like being on your podcast, that was the first podcast I'd ever been on. And that felt awesome. I was like, hey, like we're heading in a great direction. Uh, and then in the years- And then after my podcast, everything went down after- <laughs> <laughs> Literally, yeah. If you, had, <laughs> like, if you had talked to me, maybe just even five, I probably still would have been positive. But if you had asked me, hey, how's the broad... The, well, the broadcast deal didn't come till maybe about 11 months after that podcast gotcha. interview. Yeah. It was the next fall. Yeah. But um, yeah, like year after year, just be, like I'm, I'm a pretty bad YouTuber in the sense that I'm not great at doing what would be best to grow my channel. But I put a lot of time into making videos. Mm -hmm. So I've put a lot of videos out in the past three I wanna, years. I want to talk about that. So you just said you're a bad YouTuber. Yeah. Um, to you, what are you not doing that leads to you to say that? Because I would say I'm a bad YouTuber too, but I want to see if what you would say is similar. I say I'm a bad YouTuber in a tongue in cheek, like following best practices kind of way. Like there Which is- Which would be I mean, like consistency or- yeah, I think the consistency one gets said a lot and I think there's something to that. Uh, but what I've noticed has worked best for me is not just being consistent, but consistently getting better at realizing what would people find interesting. I think that's what really works well on YouTube is one, just a personality that works well on video and can engage a following, but also asking yourself, what could I put onto the platform that when someone who doesn't know me sees it there will go, hey, that could be for me. And that's where, I mean, I've, so I've been on YouTube since 2011, uploading regularly since 2015. And that's where when guys like, like Peter McKinnon comes on the platform and just absolutely crushes, it left me with my pants down and I was like, I was almost, I was frustrated because I said, I said, nobody could do what Casey already did, which is make videos about making videos in the way Casey did. And then out of nowhere, here comes another Canadian. <laughs> like, Was it worse because he was Canadian? It was worse because he was a Canadian living in a small town. And I told myself the reason why Casey grew is because he's in New York. Like I just had this narrative. I was like, I won't be able to grow a channel like that. And Peter comes out of nowhere. He ups the production value of what I was doing. And he makes the content just more interesting to those who might find it interesting. And there, there, there could be an argument made of like, oh, like, are you sure you want the same kind of audience as Peter? Which like, I'm not sure if I'm even pursuing the same viewers, but there's something to be said about an ability to put something out there that people actually are willing to click on. And so I watched him video after video. He, and at first I was just mad because I was like, this guy came out of nowhere and he's just crushing. But I realized, since then, since he's blown up, there's been a lot of backstory on, hey, he's actually been developing this skill set for decades. And so his ability to have a sense, like he's just got an uncanny skill set for what someone might find interesting. So that's when I say I'm a bad YouTuber. I'm not very great at that part. So like I'll spend two months on a video and it will like perform worse than like a regular upload. And that's just like not like the smart thing to do if I'm wanting to excel on the platform and not just be an artist or a storyteller is thinking, how can I position this so that way it's got a headline that grabs attention. And this is different than clickbait. This is different than bamboozling people. But those who have the skill set of that grow very well. And the content has to back it up. And that's what I noticed about what Peter was doing is that he was making a promise with the video title and he was delivering on it. So I like the respect was earned almost immediately, but I was still like, I was bummed. Cause then, then now I'm getting comments on my videos being like, oh, now you're just following Peter. And I'm like, oh shoot. Like I gotta, I gotta really work on finding my own voice now because it's getting more crowded. And I think missing, I don't know if I would say that's a missed opportunity, but I think that showed me, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't thinking large enough on the platform and I was giving myself more excuses. And since then, since watching that happen, I have been asking myself more, if I want to do this YouTube thing, what could I make in my way that people would enjoy? And not just like the people that currently follow, but also how could I get it to go a little, spread out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Seth Godin uses this word fungal. You know, it's like, cause fun fungus can grow in like no light and it just spreads instead of going viral, it's going fungal. And I was asking myself that, like, what could I do? And that ended up leading to this past year, I made some of the more interesting YouTube style videos that I've ever made. What it, are some of those? I, I did this whole series where I was trying to get in shape and I, it was not a great filmmaking series. It was not a great, the cinematics aren't, in it aren't amazing, but I asked myself, what would it look like to try tell a little narrative about my own experience over a series 
that could totally fail because the end goal was to run with Casey Neistat at a, at, when I finally met him for the first time. And that's one example, but I also, I stepped back from making as many regular vlogs that I was doing. And I started to ask myself, it's okay to make a vlog if the production value is down, but how could I communicate something during the vlog that is more interesting? Like Peter would do this thing where he would shoot it kind of like a vlog, but then there would be a, t it's like a hybrid. It's like a vlog tutorial. So I was trying to figure out how could I do something like that in my own way, which eventually led to me, I had shot a web series after Untethered, which I had ended up uh, trying to release and not releasing because I was, again, running out of, this sounds like a story where I just run out of money over and over again. <laughs> but I, I was frustrated with the storytelling in the series because I was trying to hit the seven, you know, like I wanted six more. So I was like, web series is a good option for that. And maybe there's a higher chance that a big network would, eventually buy it if it's a web series because it seems like that's what everyone wants these days. And so I'd shot this web series and I was sitting on the footage. I tried to release it, but I was unhappy with the storytelling and I'd run out of money working on it. So I just pulled, I just pulled it. I got two out of five episodes out and I was just like, I'm done. But then this past year I started re-releasing it. And instead of just making it like a micro doc series about other people, I looked at, hey, people that follow me on YouTube probably are probably will subscribe because they like my way of telling stories and me as a person. Whereas before I always thought my personality was something that the viewer had like an obstacle to, for the viewer to get around. Like, Oh, Levi's just in the way of the content I'm trying to get. And then once I started to understand what was happening on YouTube more and more, it's no, no, no. People that follow are following because they appreciate my perspective. And if they don't, then they will probably stop following. But if they follow for following me as a filmmaker and they don't just, if they subscribe, I should give them content from my perspective. So I re-edited the whole series trying to add in voiceover and some vlogging clips I'd done with my phone. And I think that series is now, it's what my, the end goal, it's kind of like hybrid now because I didn't shoot it with this intent, but what my, became my goal was I want something that could feel like at any moment, this might belong on Netflix, but then suddenly it's a vlog and you're getting to know the filmmaker. And I wanted to like blend those two in a way that might be, uh, I wanted to find my own style on YouTube because now it's, it, there's a lot of people doing cinematic filmmaking -y stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I did this untethered thing. Like, what do I do now? And making that web series and getting that out this past year, like I can now confidently say, I'm really proud of my channel. Like it's not every week that I put out videos that I'm really proud of, but having made that series this past year, the Slack Life series, that I truly felt like I hadn't seen something like that on YouTube before. And I, some of the videos I positioned, like I was trying to figure out how to position them well, like I titled one, like taking a raft over a waterfall instead of just like episode five of this series, yeah, yeah. trying to see if I could position it so that way people would find it and click on it. And uh, so some of them, some of that positioning worked and some of it didn't, but it was cool to see some of it actually pop in the algorithm a little bit. Cause it's like, I think blaming the algorithm is a waste of time. It's frustrating when it when you feel like a video is great and it doesn't get traction, but I mean, it's it's not worth your time. Yeah, yeah, and partially it's on you for not making a thumbnail or making a title that would get picked up by the algorithm or would get clicked on by people. And you know, there's all the the theories about what you should do with your titles and thumbnails and how clickbaity they should be and what you should put on them. Should there be a face? Should there not be a face? And like, yeah. you can get all into that. And I know that you share thumbnails on social media sometimes or potential titles. And I think that's interesting. Just like asking your audience, like, would you rather click on this thumbnail or this one? And is this title or this one better? And you, cause then you're getting real feedback as opposed to like writing a hundred titles out and trying to decide what's the best way. Because yeah, you put, a ton of time into an episode of Slack Life, and you want people, you want more people to watch it. And if to get yeah. more people to watch it, you have to say, "Go over waterfall in a Walmart raft" or whatever the title was. Then maybe that's what you have to do. And I know some people talk. I'm I'm somewhere in the middle between like titles and thumbnails like shouldn't be clickbaity, and they kind of need to be to work because that's the game you have to play, but it's also like, I don't want to have to play that game. And so I think until you get to a certain level, then you can kind of be like, I'm just going to do whatever I want, but it definitely helps. Yeah. It's bad advice to follow Casey Neistat's titling strategy. 
Yeah, I think if you try to do <laughs> titles like anyone over a million subscribers, it doesn't make sense no. because they already have an audience. And so at that point, their video is going to pop up in front of enough people that it has to be intriguing. But if you're doing titles that are, she did what? Like no one is ever going to find that if you have 70 subscribers. No. Nope. Because you have to show up and search. Right. You have to have bringing audience from somewhere else if that's ever going to happen. So it's it's like a game you have to play, but you can also play it in like an authentic way. That's why that consistency advice bothers me a little bit. I'm, I I think it I do think it's the I do think the advice is true, but it's one of those things where it's consistency and consistently getting better. One, it, if you aren't consistently getting better at how to position your content on the platform, if that is not a priority to you, if you're not asking yourself, what do the people who currently follow me, what would they find interesting? And I mean, this isn't, this isn't people pleasing your audience because there's very good reasons to change your style over time because people get them stuck in a rut and they're like, I have to make stuff where my audience gets mad. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. But if you figure out what do people like I mean, consistency is just a part of it. Like I've consistently skipped three weeks at a time throughout this whole process and, and here I am, you know, and I think it's been health, healthy for me to take those little extended breaks. So that way I don't just, I'm not just stuck in this hamster wheel because it's a lot of work running a YouTube channel. And uh, I mean, it's, n that's why I say I'm a bad YouTuber. I'm proud of crossing a hundred thousand. Like that was the, the only goal I ever set on the platform. But I acknowledge if I had been more intentional about it and it wasn't getting the bottom scraps of my attention early on, like there isn't a reason why I couldn't have built a healthier audience earlier. That's just what I'm, that's kind of my whole thing with like, I'm, I'm not like your, your YouTuber's YouTuber. Like I'm just not great at the implement. I know a lot of the tactics, but I don't implement them. And that's, I've been trying to get better at that because it's, it's not necessarily helping me if I'm not there's someone said like, you should spend as much time trying to get your video out there as you spent making it. And I disagree with that. Yeah, me too. But I think there's, I don't think it's right to spend 10 hours editing and two minutes uploading. I don't think that's right either. So I've been trying to strike a little bit of a better balance with that. Yeah. I feel like I've always come from the side of you should put as much energy as possible into making the thing. And if it's good enough, it will reach people. But I do see that you have to also market whatever it is you make. And I feel like I've only now realized that from personal experience after making SwitchPod and a physical product of having to, we've spent months and months making this thing. And if we don't bring people on the journey of all this stuff that I've done behind the scenes to like get it made and to market it and everything like that, then there's no story. It's just, yeah. it's just a product against all the existing products. And like what you're saying about people following you for your story, your viewpoint of the thing you're making and starting to treat YouTube or Instagram or social media, anything I post online more like that instead of if it's good enough, like they'll be interested and they'll pay attention to it and treating it instead like I'm interesting and they're paying attention to me and what I think. And that's even part of why I wanted to bring the podcast back is because I have conversations like this with people in private yeah. uh, when we're at NAB or whatever after walking the show floor or on Skype or something. But I think being more public about our experiences, our thoughts about all of the th this, I think is really important. Um, yeah, I just, I just yeah. appreciate like having these kinds of conversations with other creatives because most of the time we're at home editing and scrolling through Twitter, Twitter while stuff like renders. And it's just like, it, it becomes a lonely experience. Oh yeah. Making stuff on the internet. Um, luckily my wife's there and she's at home in the office with me. And so I'm not only by myself Thumbs up for partners. <laughs> yeah. So either business partners or relationship or what have you to, to not feel alone, but it can still feel lonely without those touch points of conversations with people mm -hmm. and, and just getting feedback about some of this stuff that I think we all deal with of seeing other people be really successful and how does that make me feel about myself and should I even care? And like those types of things are things I think about. Too. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, people often are trying to find a way to, to build relationships with those that are like 
so much further down the, the journey than they than they are. And I mean, in some ways you could say I did that with this run with Casey thing, but I really think it's important to have like horizontal relationships where someone's in a slightly similar category to what you're currently at and doing. And like, I mean, when we started becoming friends, like you were further along the business route, you were more mature, you were more established in your life, but it's been really cool to look back across the past, I mean, three years now and really have felt like, oh, hey, we've both been growing in our own ways at the same time together. And that's like, that's cool. And like those types of relationships, I think are what allow someone to go the distance. So like, if they're constantly trying to figure out how can I leverage this friendship to get ahead, like then you're, then it's, then it's a total numbers thing. It's like, who's the biggest person I can go after to try. You're looking for someone else to make your career happen. Yeah. You're trying to leverage. And I think what you you should be looking for is just teammates. It's like, Hey, we've got these own little products going on. A rising tide's going to raise all ships. Like, let's just go for it. And when you get knocked over, I'll send you a text and be like, Hey, like you have, you haven't uploaded in a month. Like you, you're going to, do you care about your channel? And I, I might be saying that to you and you can say that back to me. And it's like, you know, it's one of those things where yeah. I think those relationships are really, really important. My, my buddy and former business partner, Chase Reeves over at Fizzle, he had this theory. I think it was called third tier theory of when you go to like a conference, there are the people speaking on stage. That would maybe be the first tier. And when someone speaks, they're popular enough. There's a huge line. Like everyone wants to like say hi or thank them. And they're at the point in their career where they've written books or they're got a big enough following on social media or YouTube or what have you. That's like the first tier. And the second tier is maybe people that know them, or maybe it's other speakers or people run the event or what have you other bigger names in the room. And then this third tier are people that are kind of at your level mm. and Wherever that is for you, that's where I think you kind of invest your time because you might think that getting to know whatever top tier person might help you in some way, but really in the long term over the years of relationship building, you find your crew at your level or near your level. You become friends with them. You have mastermind groups. You hang out at these conferences and then you go off and do your own thing. And then the next time you get together, like you said, everyone starts to to rise a little bit. And I think it's those types of relationships and people that can really impact you business-wise, but also just like emotionally, as opposed to chasing right. the higher level people. Now, there are times when I think that can help to get in front of those people. Or in your example, I think you came to the run with nice debt thing with a sense of like honest, like appreciation and thankfulness for Casey and what he's done video wise and what he's able to do fitness wise. And I think that was part of why you did it in the first place. You didn't do it. You would have thought of an easier way to try to leverage off of Casey than running six miles every day for like three months or whatever you did. Yeah. So I think that, there's a way to come from it in an honest way that's mm -hmm. not just trying to like take advantage of someone that already has an audience as well. Yeah, there's there's something to be said about trying to get in the room with your heroes and just be there and experience that because it can expand the way you think about things. But I mean, like the people that I'm in the trenches with, you know, it's it's just different. Like, you know, the people that are and they say, you know, you become like the five people that you're close with. And so those that maybe don't have the ambition to go to the distance, maybe those relationships do fade away and they don't stand out as much. But I mean, another 10 years from now, I want to have relationships that are deeper than I have now. And I don't know if I'll get that by constantly thinking those around me currently aren't the right people. I think that's like a big mistake. Can we, can we talk about uh, client work? And cause I feel like yeah. I opened up this loop where I was like my business tanked and the uh, yeah. tether didn't work. Yeah. So tell me how you've built the client side of your business. Cause I do have a business now that works <laughs> yeah, thankfully, <laughs> which is why I'm alive in here. No, that's good. No, I want to hear more about it and tell me how you, you did use untethered to niche down, right? but they didn't come to you through that. So what did you do after that kind of stage of my calling card is not getting any phone calls. There's a, there's a great example from James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits. It's a story that I really like because it just like makes a lot of sense to me in the way I think about things, which is 
there's a huge difference between setting a goal and then actually building a process that gets you to that goal. And it's so common for us to have very similar goals to other people. And one of those for me is I would love to have a clean studio at home. I have a home studio that's detached. It's like my space. Literally, I'm the only person who goes in there. And it's a mess always without fail. And occasionally every two months or so, I'll just do this frantic cleanup because I really do value having a clean space to work. Like, I mean, there's a lot of great reasons to have your stuff organized, to have a clean, productive desk to sit down and clear your mind. And literally the next 24 hours, it's a mess again. And if I ask myself, I go, I go okay, my goal isn't a problem because I would tell you, I would love to have an organized, clean studio. And yet, there's no process to actually get there. Okay, I, I occasionally freak out and clean everything rapidly, but in like 24 hours, it's the same. There's no place for things to go. I don't put things back when I'm done using them. I don't clean up at the end of the day. My systems and my processes aren't there to, to go the distance. I've seen the Levi explosion in a hotel room before with the gears and cables and batteries, and but it, somehow you pack it all right back up. And it, you, like, so you have a system, but... It's, it's not it's an the Levi way. system. Yeah, it's the Levi way. And I realized back, back when I was trying to figure out this client problem, basically it's, it's similar. I had this goal. I'd love to work with great clients that respect me, that love my style, that will pay me what I'm worth and hopefully be work that I'm passionate about and maybe mean something. And the problem was I wasn't getting emails. So I had this goal, and I think a lot of people who freelance or are creatives have a similar goal. Uh, they want to make work that matters. And I started to ask myself along with that, hey, rule of seven question, how do I kind of, how do I start to solve this? Like, am I serious about getting more client work that actually aligns with what I'm doing? Because at this point, shooting my cousin's wedding isn't the answer. Like, I don't think that's going to be the route that gets me closer to my goal. I think that's like a side trail that maybe it's okay to do it in the short term, but it's not actually gonna, gonna take me there. And so I was like, okay, I wanna get paid to do this stuff. My current film out there isn't, isn't cutting it. And so how do I, how do I solve this? Uh, and again, our friend Sean McCabe kind of convinced me that if you approach a business, a business and do pro bono work, do it on your own terms. So approach a dream business, approach a dream company. Don't just wait for the day that they reach out to you and, and approach them and go, hey, this is, this is where I'm at. I'm starting a production company. I do great work. Link them something that you've done before. That's always important. You have to do great work. And say, I'm willing to do a project for you guys if you want to come under my process. And if they say, yes, this is fantastic, because then you actually get to go treat them like a paid client. And what I love to do with positioning the services that I offer as, as a video business is asking, you know, the clients, Hey, what are some of the problems you're facing as a business that would make you more money? And if that business is a good business, they probably know the answer to that, or at least one of the obstacles they're trying to solve to get better access to those they're trying to reach. And storytelling is a great way to do that. And so I found if you sit down with a business and you're able to find out, Hey, what, what could I do video wise that would actually be most valuable to you? And you have that conversation with them up front before you talk about budget, before they send you, Hey, can you do it for this much? And you go, Oh, I don't know. That's not that much before that. If they send that first, then you just say, Hey, can we actually talk about that in a moment? I'd love to actually figure out what you want in the first place. Cause maybe making a promo video isn't the right option. And so sitting down with this client that you've chosen, if they're willing to come under your process, this is great because then you can build them something that actually works. And if you built them a solution to a problem they have as a business, and you did a good job, hopefully that will make them a ton of money. Hopefully that will be a great tool in their marketing assets and tell them, say, Hey, don't tell anybody I did this for no charge. Um, brag about it if you like it. And if you want to do it again, please hire me for my rate. And if you actually basically found out what you could make for them, treat it like a, treat it like they could say no to your project, like make a proposal, put the number on there. You'd love to charge for it and then cross it out and put, put zeros, but like show them what it would cost to do it and they will value it more. This whole free work thing frustrates me because someone will email, someone will say, Hey, I get these requests on Instagram to do free videos for people. And they'll like give me dinner or something like, should I do it for the experience? It's like, no, 
Like, do you want to do more of those types of products? Unless it's by chance, somehow a dream business that's offering this, which the dream businesses never offer that in the first place. Like, don't do it. Approach a business that you actually want to work with and then do a great job and start like, then you have a solution that a, another business in the marketplace will see and they'll go, hey, we want that too. And that's what gets you a, like, if you think about it from the client's perspective, why would they ever trust someone who doesn't have a good example out there that you'll do a good job for a lot of money? Like, why would they, that's why I get so passionate about this. Cause that's my mindset that I was at in January of 2016 of just, I was entitled. I think I was like, I've built a skill set. The work will find me if it's good work. Well, in this day and age, good work isn't quite enough for everyone. You know, if we're in that place where we're trying to get paid to do this, why don't we actually take it seriously? Keep working a day job, keep working part-time job, pay your bills somehow, but be doing the work that actually allows clients to find you in a way and go, Hey, we want that too. And you go, perfect. This is like, you, and then you take them through the exact same process and you actually charge what you're worth. And that's worked for you to do the pro bono into a paid job with that company or pro bono into pointing at that to another company? It's the mixture of, of pro bono and something I call the ladder. So the pro bono work has gotten me paid work again from the same client. So one of my sailing clients who I've now done three videos for, uh, I, the first video I made for them, I just made cause I wanted to. And in that, in that example, I actually didn't even take them through what I was developing as my client process, that whole, Hey, what problem are you kind of yeah. trying to solve? That's the process I took them through later when they're like, Hey, we'd like to do a, like a promo video with you. Uh, but where this doesn't, where this falls apart is obviously it doesn't, it's not sustainable to just keep doing free videos for like pro bono videos for people. And that in some ways like dilutes the market and it's, it's so it's yeah. not a great strategy to like keep doing it over and over again. But I know in that year I did specifically two that then I had these great examples. I did a good job. So I asked them, Hey, can you write a paragraph about what it was like to work with me on this? And guess what they're writing in that? They're like, Levi's insight to position this around how do we actually make money with this was, was fantastic. Other videographers we're talking to were focused on, you know, what it was going to cost and Levi was trying to figure out what could it get for us. And like, so then I've got this paragraph and then the next time someone emails me and I'm sitting in a meeting with them, trying to propose to them my process, I got to say, I get to take out a physical piece of paper, Ramit Sadie business briefcase yeah. technique. And I get to put it in front of them and go, Hey, here's, here's a client that was really happy that I worked with them. And I get to call them a client because I actually took them through my client process. I didn't do free work. And so again, to level up and to get higher paying clients that actually have money to invest, because those are the ones that can be really fun to work with on a business level. Uh, what I also did as well as the pro bono work was if someone did agree to take me on and they were going to pay me, let's say $2,000, I'm going to do whatever I can on that $2,000 project to make it look and to have the concept be as strong as possible. And the reason for that is the next time I'm in, I'm in a meeting with someone, I want to be able to point to that video that I only got paid 2000 to make and, and say have it, it look, was 10 or 15. Yeah. Or, yeah. And I like actually have it look like an amazing finished result. And they would never know the difference that I didn't charge them that much. What are some ways, ways that you could do that? Would you, would you take that $2,000 rent equipment that made it better or rent crew or people, or how would you, how would you do it to make it look bigger? In the early days, it was using the 50% deposit the client paid me to buy tools, like, hey, making sure I had the right microphone, uh, maybe getting a new tripod. So it was production equipment. And that, so that was the things that those were my hard costs where, hey, this is money I need to spend. But then on me personally, I just, I obsessed over the project. I would do whatever I could mentally, like emotionally. So time, you put time. in more time to it before, during the shoot, after the shoot, editing. Mm -hmm. color grading, sound, all that stuff. Yeah. I didn't care how many days of editing it should have taken. I took as long as it took to get it to be an amazing result. Yeah. I see on my projects, if someone's paying me a certain amount and I, it's kind of evolved over the last four years, I will put in that amount of effort. And so having that mind shift of, okay, this is what I could get budget wise to do this thing. But in the next year or two, I want to be doing at this Right. two, three, four X this level. So what can I put into this project time-wise, gear-wise, calling in favors, whatever to, to make that happen? 
I like that mindset. Yeah, it's it's just a growth mindset. It's tre- it's kind of treating it more like a startup. You're acknowledging this isn't scalable all the way down the road, but for now it's worthwhile because I would like to be paid more. So in the short term, because I'm trying to build a business from nothing, this is worth this is worth doing because I don't want to be stuck at this level where I'm only being offered thousand dollar videos and I'm telling myself I'm not getting paid more because I don't have the work to show I can do it better. Yeah, you get stuck in the hamster wheel of the of that price or of that ceiling of where you're at in your business if you don't do something to break out of it. If you don't proactively seek out a bigger opportunity, a bigger budget or doing something that that stands out. So, let's be clear, like our skill set is hard won. And if you can trade that skill set for money, for time, doing technician work, that's totally respectable and reasonable. I've done plenty of technician work where I'm acknowledging, hey, I'm trading a day worth of my time for a day rate. And this isn't a project that's furthering my career in the sense of I'm ending up with this deliverable at the end that I'm really proud of. And so there's this balance as you're, that you've got to land at in your growing as a company of how much technician work is holding you back from becoming the, becoming the company you want to be and how much are you okay with? And for me, that's like about a third. Like when I was in that growing stage, I'd happily, if anybody was willing to pay me to show up and just use a camera, I would take it if it was on a short notice. If it's months out on the calendar, like I, d- I usually never book mm-hmm. months out for camera operating. But I mean, if someone next month, next week wants to pay me a day rate to show up and just hold a camera, like that's a pretty good exchange for cash and you need cash if you're trying to grow a business. So there's no problem with that. And if you get a commercial client on retainer, like that's a great thing to have. And it could maybe be, that could be the day job that enables you to actually build this boutique production company that you're really, you know, you're really proud of one day. Yeah. I think that brings you a step closer to where you want to be going from an unrelated day job to at least doing video work, if that's your thing to pay your day bills and to, you know, one for the meal, one for the real, you know, you've heard that before, I'm sure of just continuing to make money, at least doing your craft. Like that's a good next step. Mm -hmm. And then the next step from that might be closer to the kind of work or the kind of clients you want to do or on your own choosing or schedule or what have you. So I think it's a progression for sure, especially now with, even more people being enabled to to make video with gear coming down in prices, uh, equipment, other stuff, software, just more people coming up watching YouTubers, learning skills of how to film. So it like gets more competitive. So if you do want to stand out, you do have to do the the niching down, the building of the portfolio, and and then you can get your dream clients. Yeah. So the, it took me three years to build. Like this last year I was saying is the first year that I've been proud of my YouTube channel, like truly, and also proud of my business being like, oh, hey, well, like I built, I've now built this business to what I was hoping it would be. And like the first year that I went full time, I think like total revenue from Left Coast, my company was around like, I think it was around $20,000. It wasn't much, but every year since then I've managed to double it, like just total amount of money coming in. And this past year was the first year we cracked the six figure mark, which was sweet. Uh, but I also, I spent a lot of money on my company Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the balance that I find myself in as we are trying to figure out what are we, as I ask myself a new set of questions of, do I want to keep doing client work or do I, do I want to shift? Like, where do I want to shift to next? That's some of the questions I'm asking is, should I double down on client work or should I use the money I'm making from client work to continue on my side gigs like YouTube. And that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. Do I, do I go full time on YouTube if I can make that work? Like, is that something that is a good move in my filmmaking career? And I'll probably still do some client projects within that, but that's like the current, that's, that's where I find myself in three years down the road of being full time. And maybe in another three years, we'll have another podcast and we'll talk about what you learned. A try anniversary at three year. Yeah. It's not biannual. What does that make it? Triannual. Triangle. Triangle. I'd love that. Well, thanks for being on here, uh, Levi. Where can people go to find you online? Just Google Levi Allen. Don't Google Levi Vanderquack. Vanderquack will find you some stuff. Yep. 
it'll be pictures of me younger on my first blogs. That's act that actually That's might be probably worthwhile. better. Google that yeah. Vanderquack. Yeah. Google Levi Vanderquack and let me know what you find on Twitter. All right, perfect. Thanks, Levi. Of course. If you enjoyed my conversation with Levi, definitely check out his work. You can find him at Levi Allen pretty much anywhere, especially on YouTube. That's where he puts out a lot of his short films and filmmaking tutorials and tips. Definitely check him out. If you're interested in SwitchPod, which is the tripod that I invented for vloggers, you can go to switchpod.co. That'll redirect you right now to the Kickstarter page while well, that's live until the end of March, 2019. If you wanna pre-order it there, or if you're listening to this beyond that date, that link will take you to where you can order it online as well. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to the show either by subscribing to my YouTube channel where I'm publishing the video versions of these conversations or just to the audio feed via your podcast app, whether that's iTunes or Spotify, Overcast, whatever you use. You can also review us on those platforms. That really helps the show reach more people. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. I've been Caleb Wojcik and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.